Thank you, Professor Chris. Uh, first of all, let me present my acknowledgement for, this, for the organizer of this event that made possible my uh, presence here. I appreciate very much this opportunity and to hear about uh, new ideas and new contribution to this very quite interesting area of knowledge. So uh, I was invited to talk about a paper that was published uh, a few years ago about the historical environmental budget of bioethanol in Brazil and the future expectation. And my presentation will, will deal with past, some views of the past, not so late past, maybe the early 2000, then the present situation and some speculation about the future. Uh, I did this uh, 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 environmental uh, budget uh, based in the long tradition that Brazil uh, has producing ethanol. The ethanol program over there started, really started in 1975. So when I decided to do this budget, we had already 32 years of uh, experience in this area. And uh, uh, we know quite well that when you plant uh, the sugar cane, all ethanol in Brazil comes from sugar cane. When you, we <coughs> do the plantation and the harvesting of the, at the sugar cane crop, you, we emit eight uh, molecule grams uh, from, of CO2 per molecule gram of ethanol produced. And this is a well-known number. There are many evaluations. This is the classical energy balance of the agricultural phase. There is no too much discussion on this issue. Then you, you harvest, uh, you come with sugar cane grows up, and you harvest the sugar cane. When you harvest it, you have 209 uh, molecule grams of CO2 per molecule grams of ethanol. And go to the, uh, the uh, industrial phase, where you do the processing and the transformation of the sugar cane in ethanol. And then in doing that, you release 77 uh, CO2, uh, units of CO2 uh, from the boilers. The, fa the facility is that if you are using ethanol, all the energy that is produced in the plant, all heat and electricity necessary in the plant, and even more than that, some surplus electricity, is, that is exported to the grid comes from the sugar cane bagasse. So it's also the so, same source of biomass. You don't need any fossil fuel to do this processing. And then the alcohol, these 88 units of CO2, uh, is a fuel that is being used in, in cars. But during the processing phase, we produce CO2 from fermentation. And 44 units come, come out from fermentation. The idea is that can we store this, this uh, uh, amount of CO2? Nowadays, they are just dumped in the air. Why not to store if they are very clean, as we heard before, 99.9%. The only extra thing you have to do is to dry out the water. It comes with a little bit of water. Even the ethanol that uh, comes with CO2, it's recovered. It has an economic value, so people uh, try to re remove the uh, small fraction of ethanol that goes out. But, and then this ethanol goes to the car. The car burns, has a combustion. I'm assuming full oxidation. Uh, so 88 units of CO2 goes to the air, but then it's absorbent you, to grow sugar cane. I don't know why it's black. It was a nice figure over there, <laughs> but it's black. And, and to grow the sugar cane, and now you need again 209 tons, uh, 209 uh, units of CO2. So uh, the 88 uh, units are not enough, so you, you have to push 121 from the air. So if you do this simple balance, you're going to conclude that in principle, there will be some uh, uh, negative emission. If you see how much goes to the air, if we can really store these 44 units. And this is the calculation, a simple calculation based in how many grams of CO2 per liter of ethanol you can get. One, one important aspect is that people say uh, it should be nice if we could store CO2 not only from fermentation, but from the combustion of biomass. Yeah, it's true, but look, it's not so different. And here it's 44 and the combustion is 77. It's not so bad if we are uh, doing part of the job. And I will show up why we should uh, not be concerned with the other part. Regarding the past, this was the, the 
our preliminary publication in 2003 when we tried to evaluate uh, the possibility of uh, how it works in Brazil is essentially the sucrose goes to ethanol and most countries, most of the sucrose goes to sugar and then only the surplus that cannot be crystallized as sugar goes to ethanol. But in Brazil, in order to produce a large amount of ethanol, we are using sucrose directly to ethanol plus this molasses that is available from the sugar industry. And uh, we considered all that and this was the result at that time. Okay, if you do uh, CO2 from fermentation, you could probably mitigate this amount of, uh, of CO2. If you do CO2 from, uh, from the uh, uh, combustion, you could mitigate this amount. But the problem is that to, to store, to uh, capture and store this kind of CO2, you need too much electricity and too much heat. And we concluded that this would be the amount of electricity and heat, the amount of energy required to do both of these two phases. So the net gain is likely almost the same as this one. We are using too much energy to, to capture uh, CO2, and mainly because of the CO2 from combustion. Because this is, comes from the flue gas, you have a lot of problem of doing the, the capture, uh, do, doing the separation between <coughs> CO2 and all the other uh, uh, gases which comes out from the chimney. So this was the conclusion. And then we said, okay, uh, really we have a problem because we need a lot of uh, electricity and heat to do this. But at that time, uh, uh, the, the possibility is that uh, we were producing very little uh, electricity from sugarcane. And we speculate that if we could increase it from just 15 kilowatt hours per ton of sugarcane, if you could increase it to maybe 60, 100, this would reduce, the, uh, would, would uh, help the, the, uh, the procedure. Today, we are producing 175 kilowatt hour per ton of sugarcane. So we are even much better than we, what we speculated at that time. And then also at that time we said, okay, the cost can be maybe $70 per ton of CO2 to do this operation. But uh, the problem is that we were uh, thinking about shipping this to the sea and maybe dumping in the sea bed, uh, under the sea. And this is why it came with $70, $70 per ton. And finally, uh, uh, if a storage site is nearby, we claim that we could get better uh, cost. And really, uh, today, we believe that we can dump the CO2 in, in saline aquifers, uh, which are very nearby the, the sugarcane industry. So we can probably have a better number than this one. So this is the part. Also, I was able to find another. Uh, it's not only uh, one, one, uh, one people. Uh, there are a few people investigating this possibility. This is another study that I, I found recently. Uh, is a calculation based not in sugar cane, but in sugar beet. The sugar beet, as the corn, has the inconvenience that you need fossil fuel because you don't have the biomass to be burned as the sugar cane bags to produce heat and electricity. And this study, they did some evaluation. They come to the conclusion also that it's better to do only CCS from fermentation and not CCS from the, the combustion. And you can see again here that the amount, this is for fermentation and from the boiler. This is the amount of, of CO2 that you, you can sequester. And this is only for fermentation. So the number is only, so the, the, the CO2 from, from the, the, the combustion is roughly the same amount as the CO2 from fermentation, but the cost is huge. The difference in cost is three times more costly if you want to do from, from uh, the combustion. Uh, now about the present, I will skip this because we heard we had a presentation from uh, Dr. Henrik. Henrik talked to us about uh, the present situation. The, let me just uh, say a few words. I, I am involved in this project uh, to do an, uh, a, a carbon capture and storage uh, project in Brazil nearby sugar mill. Uh, the GF has provided uh, 11 million dollars grant for that. But at this moment, the project is uh, not canceled, but uh, uh, not active at this moment. We are having difficulty in negotiating with the ethanol industry, which is facing a lot of difficulty in the country 
uh, in these last two or three years for many reasons, including climate, uh, uh, the climate situation. Now, about the budget, the article has been published on the energy policy, and let me present here uh, what are the assumptions. What I'm going to show is a set of slides trying to show how, this, how we can do this budget year by year in this 32 years period. And we based it we use the historical yield of sugar cane from 75 to 2007. And this uh, is really real. The historical uh, pr uh, uh, production of uh, ethanol from sugar cane in 2005 was around 2,000 liters per hectare. Today is above 7,000 liters per hectare. So you're going to see the begin was very poor performance. Original land vegetation with an intensity of 20%. And this is not really an assumption. We, we really search the, the information where the sugar cane has grown. And we are finally, after doing a, a, a account, we came to the conclusion that we could say that roughly is the, instead of replacing a tropical forest the, where we, we grow the sugar cane, we were replacing a vegetation that has the intensity, the original vegetation had intensity of 20% of a tropical forest. Uh, the production of electricity sold to the grid, this uh, is, uh, has started in 86, but it's still very incipient, you're gonna see. Emission due to sugar plantation, harvest and processing comes from uh, uh, one author, well-known author, and this is the, the energy balance from the uh, agricultural phase and industrial phase, which is well understood. We consider N2 emissions either because of fertilizer and because of the burning of sugarcane. And the fuel efficient for ethanol, 1.3 liters per liter of gasoline. In order to, to move the same distance, we assume the 1.3. Really, today, the fleet is more near 1.4 than 1.3. So it's a little worse than we, we had assumed. And this is a plot showing that these are real emissions to the atmosphere. These are absorption. So at the beginning, because of the above and below ground vegetation that you are removing to, to grow, to plant uh, uh, the crop, you are emitting a lot of uh, CO2. Then, not only because of the, uh, you, you increase your emission because you are um, moving, digging the, 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 the ground, and when you dig the ground to prepare it for another crop, you are releasing carbon from the soil, so this adds negative emission. But then, uh, as sugarcane grows, sugarcane is, is, a, is a perennial crop with lots of uh, uh, roots, so this root grows, dies, and it provides a supplement of carbon to the soil, so the soil recovers. Then you have the live roots uh, when, when the, 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 the plantation typically is a, is a semi-perennial. Every five or six years you, you do a new planting, but during these five or six years you have live roots uh, below, below the, the ground. Then you have the uh, sugarcane above ground biomass, it, every year it grows and you cut, grows and cut, but on the average this gives uh, half the size of uh, the, the largest the triangle. And then you come with the replacement of gasoline. This is the ethanol that is being burned for combustion in place of gasoline. And what else? And the, the uh, uh, production of electricity, bioelectricity from the, from the sugar cane, sold to the grid. And this is a small amount, really. You barely can see it's a black on top of the other one. It's a small amount. Uh, and the results are that you can accumulate the N2, uh, net CO2 emission uh, uh, up to the end of the period of 2007 of the order 1.5 tons of CO2 per cubic meter of ethanol. A, the payback to neutralize an initial emission is 18 years. Why the payback is 18? You can see here, it took 18 years until we reached zero. So for the first 18 years, the ethanol program in Brazil it was adding more, more pollution to the atmosphere than really removing. And uh, a negligible contribution from electricity. You see. Uh, but when we did this calculation, the issue of indirect land use was not well uh, uh, analyzed. Uh, still now, there are many doubts about indirect land use, but uh, so we had to, to add, uh, we have to add uh, indirect land use to this calculation. And uh, the other point is that the 
all these emissions we accounted in real time when it, it happened. Uh, and we learned nowadays that there are different uh, rules for that. The emission that occurs uh, when you do the, uh, when you remove the above and below ground biomass, you have to spread it in 20 years, not only in one year. The same with, with the uh, uh, carbon from the soil. And we had to add the uh, indirect land use where one particular data, one particular study, the one by EPA that was made as uh, uh, fulfilling a request from the, the Congress of the United States, they said that in case of sugarcane, the indirect land use is only four grams of CO2 per megajoule. To give you a, 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 a yardstick, usually you have an emission of 100 grams of CO2 per me megajoule if you are using fossil fuel, gasoline or diesel. So uh, instead of using this four that is very low, there are another, another uh, study. I prefer to use this number, the difference between these two numbers, which is 21 grams of CO2 per megajoule as the indirect land use. And then here you see a comparison between, this is the same study accounting for real time. So the emission occurs in the first year and we account it in the first year. But the difference is this has no indirect land use. This has indirect land use, 21 grams. It's, it really uh, reduces the amount of mitigation from 150 to something like uh, uh, 100. And, uh, and now this is with a new rule. If we can spread out the emission that occurs on the first year, we can spread out over 20 years. And then you don't see any more uh, payback time is from the very beginning of the program, we had, uh, we, we had uh, reduced the emission. This is the compar comparison with uh, no indirect land use and with, with, with indirect land use, but all of them in 20 years period, the, the distribution of emission from the above the ground and below ground and the carbon from the soil. And the conclusion, the, and now another assumption about what would be the optimized situation if from the very beginning of the ethanol program, we had uh, uh, been able to, to uh, produce electricity in significant amount as today, uh, and, uh, and using all the bagasses and the, the some other uh, trash from, from sugarcane as a source of energy. And then this is the, the result. And now I, I'm adding a yellow curve here, which is the limit of negative emission. If you are above this yellow curve, you are producing negative emission. And this is the contribution from ethanol. This is the contribution from bioelectricity. And this is the contribution of CCS from fermentation. And then we are above the, the but this is with uh, real time. Uh, uh, and the result is that now we are much better. It's 4.77 tons of CO2. Why it has increased? Because the efficiency of production of ethanol has increased from 2,000 liters per hectare to almost above 7,000 liters. And what about the future? This is just a speculation. We did the evaluation for 32 years, so I pushed it. I said, what are going to happen the next 32 years? So this is something that started in 75 and finishes in 2039. And it's a huge amount. You can see here is the yellow curve. This is the negative emission upper uh, line. So probably we can, we can be above the, the upper line, even if you, here with, without inter, uh, indirect land use. With indirect land use, we, you barely are above uh, the, the negative emission if you rely on carbon capture and storage. And so this, this is the conclusion. I, I'm short in time, let me go over. I just want to say that uh, it, uh, this is well known for most of you that industrial carbon capture and storage uh, is a, has a very bright future according with several studies. This particular evaluation from the the, uh, the, the energy center in the Netherlands, they say that uh, we, we have all these opportunities and the blue part here is about bi biofuels. And also they say that uh, this is what uh, uh, we could produce of biofuels in the year 2050 and we could use carbon capture and storage for all this part here is uh, production of ethanol from grains, so it's almost zero here. Production of ethanol from, from uh, sugar cane and production of ethanol from uh, cellulosic biomass through enzymatic, through biochemical uh, route. 
these, all these could be used. And if you do uh, this calculation, you're going to see that uh, uh, we can really uh, uh, save, a lot, mitigate a lot of, of CO2. We can be on the negative area. But uh, I, I'm not sure that we're going to make a significant contribution uh, to reducing emission. Maybe probably 5% is the maximum that you can achieve with the global emission if we believe that we are moving to the most efficient use of fuels in the transportation sector. And uh, a recent study I, uh, I did with a colleague is that with 70 million hectares of sugarcane planted, we could propel all the fleet of cars in the, in the world if we rely in plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. I'm talking about sugarcane. And sugarcane, you produce electricity, you produce fuel, and the hybrid electric vehicles use both. So if you could uh, 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 use the sugarcane as your feedstock, and you had the proper uh, uh, share of hybrid vehicles, you could probably solve all the biofuel requirements, only the biofuel for transportation requirement with 70 million hectares. As such, even if we carry out all this carbon capture and storage uh, experience, we're going to probably save only 5% of the CO2 emission of the world. But it's very important because this is the, the, simpl the si simplest route we can follow to demonstrate that carbon capture and storage is feasible. And once you do this, you can uh, convince other, uh, other uh, actors and find other opportunities for that. Questions for Jose? And you can pick the questioners if you want. Okay. See you now. Hi. Uh, Please. Having, spent a, having spent a year or so in Brazil and enjoying the smell of uh, cars that burn vodka, it's uh, interesting to see this. But I have a basic question. If your fuel ends up as ethanol, only 70% as efficient as gasoline, and you're, uh, you, I think you said there is like a 20, uh, 5 to 1, uh, loss from uh, converting tropical forests to sugarcane land, then why don't you simply expand the nuclear program in Brazil and let the forest grow back? <laughs> That's my basic question. But do you believe that by uh, making the, the, the land going back, you could do better? Uh, this is my, my reply. And second, who will pay for that? Well, that's the point. Uh, the cost of CO2 uh, emissions now is ex going to be extremely high because no one is really looking at the real problem. The most, the, the closest problem that's going to cause starvation is ocean acidification. And that carbon dioxide, I don't know how you get that out of the ocean. <laughs> that's where 40% of our carbon dioxide that we emitted is right now. And even if we stop emitting it into the air today from all sources, it's still going to be dissolving further and, and lowering the pH. I mean, we're halfway to the point where the food chain in the ocean is uh, going to stop. But anyway, probably the first thing you have to do is to reduce emission of CO2 and then think how you remove the CO2 from the ocean. If right. You, well, you can do that. I don't know how you do it from the ocean, but from the air, you can make carbon neutral fuels using high temperature uh, reactors. Once you have 700 degrees C, reactor salt, for instance, the salt reactors, then you can actually remove CO2 from the air. Yeah. And using water, you can actually make diesel fuel that is totally carbon neutral. Yeah, you see, the, the only care I had in this uh, presentation and in my paper is that I relied everything in, in existing technology. You can really think about nice ideas like uh, second generation uh, uh, bioethanol. Sorry, but we started to, to look for that in 1914. 1914. So very soon, we're going to make 100 years that we are looking for. And still is a dream turning maybe in a nightmare. Thanks for your presentation. This is just a clarification, really. But um, you mentioned at the beginning that you weren't really looking at the CO2 coming from the boiler of the, the biomass um, burn for electricity. Is that true for all these estimates, even these last ones? when you're talking about the total potential of this kind of technology? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, uh, we never uh, consider the, the carbon capture and storage from the boiler. It's very costly and uh, probably you can do better in the coal industry or, or in the people using fossil fuel, probably they can afford to pay for that at the very beginning. I believe that the, the biomass industry can afford to, to do this kind of investment. For the fermentation, maybe it's cheaper. So the, uh, the, you're saying the biomass industry wouldn't be able to afford even out to 2039 these, these kinds at, of things? At least they won't be the pioneers. Once it developed for some other sector, probably the, the biomass industry can copy. But they are not pro, as rich or they don't have a huge revenue as other source of energy have. have. Okay, please join me in thanking Jose again. Okay, cool.